In the most pivotal scene of Sound Euphonium's first season, Reina Kosaka stands on the peak of their local hill and boldly proclaims that she will become someone special. That she can rise above the masses by playing the trumpets. Reina's declaration shakes protagonist Kumiko Omai, a girl whose every life experience taught her to bend to the will of others to her very core. Reina's defiant attitude towards music and life shows Kumiko, for the first time, that there is an alternative to conformative mediocrity. And so, Reina becomes Kumiko's ray of hope, the living proof that the individual can stand out from the crowd. After all, Reina is someone special. That's the key message of season one. A collective can be led to greater heights by the efforts of special people who strive for greatness. But then we get the series' second season. A season that seems to revolve around deconstructing the entire premise of what came before. Each of its plotlines challenge us to renegotiate our understanding of Kumiko's newfound ideal. An ideal that swerves on the fault line between childish fantasy and adult reality. On a fundamental level, the second season of Sound Euphonium sets out to explore whether anyone is special at all. Hello, my name is Sean, and I never thought I'd dedicate so much analysis to a swimsuit episode. So to put my cards on the table, I have a complicated relationship with the material under discussion. Years ago, Sound Euphonium's second season was the show that made me quit anime. Now, that might sound a bit dramatic, but let me explain. At the time season 2 first aired, I'd been watching 10 plus seasonal anime per week for a few years straight. And honestly, I was burnt out. Yet, this was really hard for me to accept. After all, anime had been my greatest passion since my early teenage years. But by 2015, every show I tried just felt boring, derivative, a waste of my time. Yet fortunately, there was one speck on the horizon, one show that would surely rekindle my passion for anime the upcoming second season of an instant favorite. I fondly remembered Sound Euphonium for its brilliant character writing, its inspiring and haunting storytelling, for its enchanting atmospheres that would reduce me to tears in a matter of seconds. So no pressure for its successor, of course. But truth be told, once season two started airing, my disappointment grew by the episode. What I got was some silly melodrama with a protagonist who just seemed to stumble upon everything merely because the plot demanded it. And so, I could no longer look away from the bitter truth. I must have been wrong to like Sound Euphonium in the first place. And with that, it felt like something in me had died forever. So I quit after six episodes, and I've barely touched anime ever since. But it wasn't until years later that I decided to give UFO another shot, and that included the dreaded second season. Now in all honesty, there are still bits that I don't quite jive with, but going in with less expectations and a different perspective gave me a newfound appreciation for season 2 and its place within Sound Euphonium's overarching narrative. In contrast to the love at first sight storytelling of the first season, its successor proved to be more intimate, more subdued. And to me at least, its depth and thematic cohesion was less immediately apparent than in season 1. Sound Euphonium 2 is the kind of series that really warrants a rewatch for it to fully convey the story that it's trying to tell. The differences between the two seasons become apparent from their plot style alone. Well, yes, the second season does continue the story of Kumiko's first year at Kitauji High School, as her school's orchestra participates in the prefectural and national concert band competition. The competitive element takes a backseat in favor of four disparate, 
smaller scale storylines that mostly revolve around the series' supporting cast. And more than that, none of these storylines are really the central focus either. Rather, Sound Euphonium 2 generates meaning by closely interweaving each of them with each other. And more than in Season 1, the development of protagonist Kumiko Omai in the season doesn't come about from her personal choices, but rather by witnessing the trials and tribulations of those around her, almost like a fly on the wall. Compared to what proceeds and follows, this season's Kumiko is granted distinctly fewer opportunities to shape the world around her. And this issue of control, or lack thereof, closely intersects with one of the series' most prominent themes, that of maturity. The cast of Sound Euphonium is comprised of teenagers on the cusp of adolescence. They're at a stage in their life where they are no longer children, yet not quite adults either. Now, I know you could say that about most any slice of life anime, but Sound Euphonium 2 plays up this tension to an extraordinary extent. At every turn, its characters are in the process of negotiating their position in the world through the dichotomy of child and adult. And more than once, the series subverts our understanding of what it means to be an adult in the first place. Given the nature of Season 2's writing, I will be weaving in and out of its different storylines much more than I did in my Season 1 analysis. And so, I want to briefly outline all four before I dive into particulars. Number one is the story of second-year student Nozomi Kasaki trying to rejoin the orchestra, and of fellow second-year student Mizure Yoroiska grappling with her unresolved trauma coming from Nozomi abandoning her. Number two is the story of Kumiko and Reina learning about their instructor Noboru Taki's deceased wife. Number three is the story of Kumiko patching up her relationship with her sister Mamiko. And number four is the story of Kumiko peeling back the mask of the club's vice-captain Asuka Tanaka. Now, what is perhaps most noteworthy about all these stories, taken in sum, is that they all center around characters who had in some way, shape, or form been deemed special. For the taciturn introvert Mizure, the naturally sociable Nozomi was both an unattainable ideal and a special friend. And more than that, Nozomi was the one who chaperoned Mizore into the world of classical music. This dynamic is paralleled by the relationship between Kumiko and Mamiko. Kumiko, similarly, became a musician because she looked up to her sister. Meanwhile, Reina, of course, is the one who convinced Kumiko that you could become special by playing music. And then there's Taki, the unflappable prodigy conductor who leads a failing orchestra straight to nationals. And finally, Vice Captain Asuka has been painted as an inscrutable genius who mastered the euphonium and effortlessly exerts authority over the club. But during its 13 episodes, the season lifts the veil, as it were, and reveals that each of these allegedly special people are in fact ordinary human beings with regular struggles and insecurities, just like anyone else. Let me start from the beginning. The second season resumes right where their first left off. The Kitauji concert band has won gold in the regional qualifications and progressed to the prefectural rounds. Right here, an orchestra that was considered abysmal not too long ago has proven that it has what it takes to aim for nationals. For Kumiko, this triumph sparks a moment of reflection as she and Reina visit their local summer festival. But there is also a second issue on her mind. The past days, she has witnessed how Nozomi Kasaki has been trying to persuade Asuka to let her rejoin the orchestra. But to no avail. Nosomi has a legitimate passion for the flute, but last year her upperclassmen had trampled her aspirations into the ground. And so, 
she grew disillusioned and quit. And seeing Nozomi's persistence, Kumiko just can't wrap her head around the reasons why Asuka won't give in. Reina, however, concurs with the band's vice captain. You simply can't rely on someone who turns tail when the going gets rough. And more than that, someone like Nozomi would never propel Kitauji to greater heights. In Reina's view, you have to stand your ground in the face of adversity to become someone special. That comment prompts Kumiko to inquire into their nebulous aspirations. Will they be special if they make it to nationals? Reina isn't certain, but at the very least, the flip side must be true. If they can't make it to nationals, there's no way they'll become special. So that's the question which ends the episode. And more than that, it's the overarching question of this entire season. And just to give the game away, when the credits roll and Kitauchi has won a bronze prize at nationals, Reina and Kumiko's dream seems further away than ever before. The first hints of this come with how Reina herself is depicted in this episode. In the preceding scenes, the show goes to great length to display that Reina too has changed since the beginning of the story. We witness how the standoffish prodigy, with no interest in superficial relationships from the first season, has started to warm up to the people around her. There's one detail in particular that jumps out to me on this front. During their hilltop dates in the first season, Kumiko likens Reina to a Yuki Onna, a snow spirit from Japanese mythology which draws her victims in with her alluring beauty. So when Reina declares that she will become someone special, Kumiko feels herself being spirited away by this otherworldly siren. For Kumiko, her first date with Reina is like entering a dream. She's leaving her mundane reality to follow the snow maiden into the realm beyond her wildest imaginations. But now, in season 2, we witness Reina slowly thawing out of her Ice Queen persona. While the two view the fireworks, Kumiko wishes that she could store this moment on ice to preserve it forever. But in light of the earlier scene, Kumiko's comment takes on further significance as well. The series associated wintry imagery with the cool, aloof Reina who pursued excellence over human connections. And so, the reference to freezing the present moment in time suggests that Kumiko wants to hold on to this version of Reina, the one who won't compromise in her relentless pursuit of an ideal. That ideal, however, stands in contrast with the reality that we're shown earlier in the scene. The real Reina can't handle the amount of shaved ice she shovels down her throat whereas Kumiko's helping melts onto the ground. By implication, the show emphasizes that in reality, neither of them is a Yukiona. If Reina sold Kumiko on a dream in season 1, the beginning of the second season shows Kumiko reawakening to the mundane world around her. Yet the firework display also serves to frame the season's concerns through intertextual means. The conversation between Kumiko and Reina is conspicuously placed between two announcements. The first salvo of fireworks is dubbed The Tale of Genji Reborn, and its climactic finale, The Romance of Genji Eternal. And I promise that this detail is much more meaningful than you'd probably expect it. In case you're not familiar with it, The Tale of Genji this um, chonker over here, is a novel by the 11th century noblewoman Murasaki Shikibu, which is considered a masterpiece of Japanese literature. The text revolves around the eponymous Genji Minamoto, this guy here. So why would the series name drop the tale of Genji at such a programmatic point? Let's start with the most basic explanation. Sound Euphonium takes place in the city of Uji, 
which is also the setting of the major part of the novel, as well as the home of the contemporary tale of Genji Museum. So on the one hand, Sound Euphonium is broadcasting that its narrative is set in the world of Genji, at least on a physical level. But in my view, there's much more to it than that. At its heart, the tale of Genji is an exploration of the nature of love, as we follow Genji through various romantic encounters in search of his ideal woman. That's at least the dimension of the Genji that Sound Euphonium plays up. In its programmatic firework display, the tale of Genji figures as a symbol of eternal romance. So basically, the scene of Kumiko and Reina articulating and interrogating their ideal of becoming someone special is situated against the backdrop of a story about a medieval noble searching for an ideal partner. That, of course, also closely ties in to the lesbian undertones of the relationship between the two girls. After all, the romance between Kumiko and Reina came about through their shared pursuit of an ideal. But Sound Euphonium 2 is a story about the nature of love in an even broader sense. Not just the love between Kumiko and Reina, but also that between Taki and his deceased wife, between Mizore and Nozomi, between Kumiko and her sister Mamiko, as well as Reina deepening her love for Taki, and, in the series finale, Kumiko expressing her love for Asuka. So with all that, it's as if Sound Euphonium is suggesting answers to Genji's overarching question about the ideal lover. And in doing so, the series carves out a place for itself in Japan's cultural history. It suggests that the Genji is eternal in the sense that it speaks to universal human experiences which are reborn through the trials of Kumiko, Reina, and the rest of its cast. Their time together may be only a fleeting moment, but they themselves are just one manifestation of an eternal romance. Anyways, let's return to Reina. Over the course of these 13 episodes, Sound Euphonium hammers home that the girl who Kumiko believed to be someone special is just an ordinary person. This becomes apparent most strongly by the greater focus on Reina's infatuation with Taki, the band's instructor. Now, Reina has already admitted that she has a crush on Taki and that she came to Kitauji because of Taki towards the end of the first season. It's only in season two, however, that this becomes an important plot point. As the series progresses, we learn a lot of things about Reina in relationship to Taki. That she comes in early in part to have a chance to talk to her teacher. We see Reina getting worried that Taki is dating an attractive colleague. We discover that Reina started playing brass instruments because she'd fallen for Taki. And that the ideals she espoused on the hilltop scene were first articulated by Taki. Reina also gets upset when she learns that Taki had a wife, and even starts ignoring Kumiko because she withheld the information from her. More and more, we're shown that the larger-than-life figure from Kumiko's imagination is actually a normal girl grappling with her first crush. Okay, so I promised an unnecessarily elaborate analysis of the swimsuit episode, and I guess it's the time for that now. As I mentioned earlier, one of the central concerns of the season is the juxtaposition between child and adult, mature and immature. So, episode 2 kicks off with Kumiko and her friends visiting the local pool. And out comes Reina in a swimsuit that accentuates her feminine features, in marked contrast to Kumiko's less voluptuous body. Kumiko, here, seems to naively assume that maturity is manifested through one's physical assets, and she reiterates this belief towards the end of the episode. Reina is the mature one, both on the outside and within. 
But what's striking about the latter scene is how its framing contrasts Kumiko's perspective with that of us viewers. Ironically enough, the scene where Kumiko emphasizes Reina's maturity comes about because Reina confided in Kumiko about her romantic insecurities. Right here, Reina doesn't come across as the mature one of the duo, but rather as a young girl experiencing puppy love and seeking comfort from her best friend. And in contrast, Kumiko is the one with the mature perspective and advice. She tells Reina to get out of her own head and just to ask Taki about the situation. And by doing so, Kumiko imparts a nugget of wisdom that will ring true time and again throughout the season. The mature course of action is consistently to talk out any interpersonal issues, even when it's painful or embarrassing. And that's a lesson Reina takes to heart. Now, I already regret what's going to come out of my mouth, but here goes nonetheless. In the following episode, Reina indeed resolves to ask Taki about the situation, and she does so during a changing scene. The point being, Reina bearing her body figuratively underpins her resolve to bear her heart to Taki as well. It's as if she's using her confidence in her physical maturity as a source of courage for taking the mature course of action. So, I guess if anyone's planning to write a fanservice scene, at least take note that they can be employed in a way that actually generates meaning. Just another example of how Season 2 emphasizes speaking out one's issues. Let's have a look at the development of Yuko Yoshikawa. In the previous season, Yuko clashed with Reina because Reina was gunning for the trumpet solo. And in the first episode of season 2, it's obvious that there are still tons of unspoken tensions between Yuko and both Kubiko and Reina. But as the season progresses, we witness Yuko slowly clearing the air. She goes out of her way to address the awkwardness between them, admits that she was wrong earlier, and even checks in on Reina when she's struggling. By implication, the way Yuko resolves her lingering conflicts earns her the right to become the club's next captain towards the end of the season. But at its start, however, it's not just Reina and Yuko who don't voice their concerns. Taki's colleague Hashimoto points out that the orchestra as a whole sounds reserved and quiet, as if they're reluctant to speak their minds. And Hashimoto is right on the ball here. As it turns out, each of the season's major storylines revolves around people not expressing their true feelings. He later singles out Mizure in particular. She's playing a solo that requires fiery passion and yet her performance is rather muted. And as it turns out, Misore's expressionless sound is reflective of her unspoken trauma regarding Nozomi. Long story short, Nozomi never told her close friend Misore that she quit the club, and as a result, Misore assumed that Nozomi just didn't care that much about her in the first place. All this, however, turns out to have been a massive miscommunication. Nozomi couldn't bring herself to ask Misure to leave with her, since Misure still seemed motivated to keep playing. And more than that, Nozomi never even realized that she'd upset Misure by excluding her. So basically, Misure's massive trauma, which manifests in severe physical reactions to Nozomi's mere presence, stems from a silly misunderstanding. Four episodes of drama could have been entirely prevented if either of them had spoken their minds. And once Misore and Nozomi have expressed their true feelings, Misore's playing improves by leaps and bounds. She can now be true to herself in her performance as well. This lesson is very much paralleled in Reina's storyline. Towards the end of the season, Reina starts ignoring Kumiko. Eventually, however, Kumiko receives the dreaded text, We need to talk. 
The first moments of this meeting are tense, to say the least. Reina asks Kumiko if she knows why she's angry, prompting Kumiko to bluff a vague response. Reina, of course, sees through the pretense and calls Kumiko out. She should just say that she doesn't know. Kumiko, in turn, retorts that Reina hasn't been open with her either, and that she hasn't said anything wrong in the first place. For Reina, however, that's exactly the point. Kumiko didn't say anything. In this scene, we witness the unpacking of layer upon layer of moments where the two failed to speak openly with each other snowballing into a devastating avalanche. And at the heart of this conflict? That Kumiko had learned about Taki's marriage and didn't tell Reina the truth. Reina eventually found out that Kumiko knew and felt betrayed by her best friend. In truth, Kumiko didn't tell Reina because she didn't want to hurt her, but this decision of course had the adverse effect. Yet, even after the two patch up their relationship, this revelation weighs heavily on Reina, to the extent that it affects her performance. Here again, the series parallels Reina's struggles to those of Mizore, whose emotional turmoil severely affected her music. And just like Mizore, Reina can only move forward once she confronts the source of her anxieties. Once more, she asks Taki about his personal life, prompting him to tell about his deceased partner. And while yes, the truth hurts, she also gains a deeper understanding of who Taki is, and, as it seems, a deeper love for him as well. Reina has faced her insecurities head on, and in doing so, her sound becomes stronger than ever before. That brings me to the season's third storyline, that of Kumiko reconciling with her sister Mamiko. From the very beginning of the story, it's made abundantly clear that the relationship between the two sisters is fraught with tensions. Mamiko is surprisingly dismissive of Kumiko's decision to continue band rather than dedicating herself to her studies, just like she'd done all those years ago. It's only in season 2, however, that the story properly hones in on Mamiko and her inner turmoil. And here, too, the series focuses on the importance of speaking your mind, and the question of what it means to be mature. As it turns out, Mamiko never wanted to give up playing the trombone herself. Rather, her parents insisted that she'd make sure to get into a good college, and as the eldest child, she gave in. But in the end, following the path her parents set out for her didn't bring her happiness. And after swallowing compromise upon compromise, she can't take it any longer. Mamiko abruptly drops out of college to pursue her dream of becoming a beautician. As with so much in this season, Mamiko fell out with her loved ones because she failed to speak her mind. She never told her parents that she didn't have an interest in academic pursuits, and when she quit band, she only lashed out at her younger sibling who positively idolized her. And that brings me to one of my favorite scenes in the season, the reconciliation between the two sisters. Once again, we're asked to re-examine which of them is the adult and which the child. Mamiko has opted to cook, but her efforts are a spectacular failure. This moment captures Mamiko's current situation in a nutshell. She's been trying her best at being an adult, but hasn't been very successful at it. So then Kumiko comes in and makes a proper meal. By implication, the younger sibling is the one who actually has her act together, just like how Kumiko has also most likely surpassed her older sister as a musician by this point. Up till now, she believed that she was acting like an adult by subordinating her personal desires to societal expectations. But in actuality, she was simply avoiding the responsibility of making her own decisions. And where did this leave her? She ended up 
throwing a temper tantrum like a child. Kumiko, on the other hand, seemed to be acting selfishly by prioritizing her club over her studies, at least from her sister's perspective. But as we viewers of course know, Kumiko's experiences in her band have been pivotal for her growth and self-actualization. By implication, that's what allows her to now act as an adult in front of her older sister. And so, as Mamiko scrubs away the filth and stains of her cooking, she also resolves to clean up her act. To stop pretending like she's a world-wisened adult, and to tidy up her mistakes and regrets. But while Mamiko exits this season as a more fully realized person, this heart-to-heart -heart also fundamentally changes Kumiko's perception of her sister. From an early age, Mamiko has been Kumiko's idol. In fact, Kumiko got into concert bands because she admired her sister. And more than that, she saw music as an avenue to forge a relationship with her sister. That's also why it hurts Kumiko so much that music later tears them apart. So while on the one hand there is something truly beautiful about Kumiko coming to better understand her sister, she has also lost her hero, her special someone, in the process. The sister she revered has been outed as an ordinary mortal, someone with her fair share of failures and insecurities. And whether she likes it or not, Kumiko has to now face stepping out of her sister's shadow. There's a recurring question in season 2 about who you play music for. Early on, Kumiko is struck when she learns that Mizore has continued playing the oboe because music is her only connection to Nozomi. This leads Kumiko to query Reina if she plays music for someone as well. At the time, her friend believed that this wasn't the case, that she only plays for herself. Later, however, Reina proclaims that she'll play for Kumiko this time around too. And this little storyline comes full circle towards the end of the season. Now, let me first flash back a moment to the end of season 1, to put the scene I'm about to discuss into perspective. Specifically, I want to look at the scene where Kumiko for the first time realized that she loves the euphonium. At the time, she blurted this out as an act of resistance against her sister, who chastised her for doing something as pointless as playing music. Kumiko here retorts that it's not pointless, because the euphonium has essentially become a source of joy and fulfillment for her. But while all of this is certainly true, season 2 shows us that it's not the entire truth. The storyline with Mamiko comes to a resolution when the older sister visits Kumiko at the National Concert Band competition. And having absorbed all the lessons she's learned from her sister, Kumiko finally speaks from the bottom of her heart. She loves the euphonium, but she's come to love it because it gave her a connection to the sister she loves dearly. For me, this parallel really captures the essence of the two seasons. Season 1 of Sound Euphonium revolves around Kumiko learning to find what you might call individualistic fulfillment, by striving to become her best self and standing up for what is right. Season 2, on the other hand, shows us how Mizore, Reina, and Kumiko grow as people through their relationships with others. And what I find especially interesting about this is the way the ideas of the second season, as it were, respond to those of the first. Attaining a certain level of independence and self-confidence serves as a stepping stone to foster healthy human relationships with one's loved ones, which is presented as a deeper, richer level of self-realization. So now, Let's finally turn to the Asuka storyline, the crescendo which ties everything together that came before. Now, 
Before getting into the nitty gritty, I want to zoom out a bit and discuss why Asuka in particular makes sense as the dramatic centerpiece of the entire season. At first glance, this seems kind of remarkable. Up to the first half of the season, Asuka has never been treated as a main character. Yes, she was always very prominent among Sound Euphonium's secondary cast, but she was a secondary character nonetheless. So on my first viewing, I was honestly surprised that the show would bookend the entire season with a scene about the relationship between Kumiko and Asuka. To make sense of this, we have to understand Asuka's position within Sound Euphonium's overall narrative. Of all its characters, Asuka has most consistently been painted as a truly exceptional person. She's a determined, natural leader, as well as one of the club's most talented musicians. In essence, Asuka can do everything and make it look easy in the process. So where characters like Mamiko, Reina and Nozomi were seen as someone special to a select amount of individuals, the whole club believes that Asuka is truly special. That idea of Asuka as the exception to the norm is also built up in the earlier stages of the season. When Nozomi tries to rejoin the band, she's strangely fixated on getting Asuka's approval. So why Asuka in particular? Because even to Nozomi, Asuka is special. Nozomi instinctively realizes that the backing of the club's actual captain or its advisors isn't enough. To be accepted back, she needs Asuka's blessing. But halfway this season, the series starts lifting the veil in which Asuka has been shrouding herself all this time. In episode 7, Kumiko witnesses Asuka's mother making a scene in the teacher room demanding that Taki let Asuka resign from her club activities. Asuka's mom insists on deciding the course of her daughter's future, and believes that her club is only distracting her from her studies. With this, the story very explicitly establishes a parallel between Asuka and Mamiko. As we've seen, Mamiko elected to give in to her parents' expectations, but by doing so, she consigned herself to a life of regrets. And now, the series situates Asuka on the very same crossroads. With this, we finally see cracks in Asuka's carefully curated persona. Even the seemingly superhuman Asuka can't resist her mother's relentless pressure. And so, she stops appearing at club practice. And the loss of Asuka is immediately felt within the orchestra, to the point that Taki effectively suspends practice for a moment. Eventually, Haruka confronts the elephant in the room. They've all bought into the fantasy that Asuka is somehow special. But in reality, she never was. And now, they have to stop relying on Asuka to fix all their problems. And that's exactly what we see later in the episode, as the Kitauchi Orchestra is scheduled to perform in a public concert. When Haski succumbs to her nerves, Midori and Kumiko jump in. They understand that they have to plug the hole that Asuka left behind in the club's leadership structure. But the one who is most tested in this instance is Captain Haruka. Earlier in the episode, Taki tells Haruka that he wants to tweak the instrumentation and to give her a solo. Haruka at the time felt serious reservations about stepping into the limelight. But after confronting the reality that they need to step out of Asuka's shadow, Haruka resolves to accept the responsibility. Her determination is tested, however, when Asuka shows up at the last minute. With that, Haruka is given the option to slip back into the comfort of her usual dynamics. But Haruka doesn't do this. Instead, she tells Asuka that she's playing the solo and asks her to have her back. And it's fascinating to see Asuka's reaction to this. 
there's a moment of silence, hesitation, as if Asuka herself needs a second before coming to grips with taking the back seat, with being just one of the band members. But more than that, the series also unveils that Asuka too has been playing for someone else all this time. Asuka confides to Kumiko that her father is a famous euphonium player, and that he separated from her mother when she was two, and that he never contacted her ever since. But one day, she found out that this man is a judge at the National Concert Band competition. And so, Asuka has been gunning to reach nationals in the hope of having her father hear her play. So here, Asuka's story is again paralleled to that of the Omai sisters. But where Asuka was first the Mamiko figure, caught between her family's expectations and her personal desires, she's now aligned with Kumiko, the younger family member using music to connect with her relative. I've already talked a lot about how the season plays with the juxtaposition between child and adult, but there's no character where this is as prevalent as with Asuka. One of the most striking aspects of her character is how frequently she casts herself as the adult, especially when dealing with difficult situations. Let's have another look at the scene where Asuka's mother demands that her daughter resigns from her club. Throughout the scene, the mother comes across as this hysterical figure throwing a tantrum, and she even resorts to violence when she doesn't get her way. In contrast, the daughter remains polite and collected, diffusing the situation. And to cap it off, she's even the one to lead her mother out of the room. The implications are clear. In this dysfunctional family, the mother has stooped to the level of a child, whereas Asuka is playing the part of the adult. It's not just with her mother, however, that Asuka assumes this mantle. Let's have a look at a key scene after Kumiko's reconciliation with Mamiko, when Asuka has stopped coming to club practice. Kumiko herself now sees the similarities between her sister and her senior, and so she wants to stop Asuka from making the same mistake as Mamiko. And what's really striking is that Asuka immediately takes on a patronizing attitude. She comments on how nervous Kumiko must have been to come into her classroom and offers her a piece of candy, as if Kumiko is some small child. Asuka's opening gambit is a massive power play. Once again, she's the adult in the room, who can therefore simply dismiss her junior's juvenile ramblings. And that's exactly what she does. When Kumiko tries to persuade her to rejoin the band, Asuka challenges Kumiko's every word with seemingly airtight reasoning. But even when Kumiko has no more rational arguments at her disposal, she can still speak from her heart. She wants to play in a competition with Asuka. Asuka, of course, tells her to stop acting like a child. But that's when Kumiko drops a bombshell of truth. It's not her, but Asuka who is acting. All this time, Asuka has been pretending to be an adult, pretending to be someone special. But in reality, Asuka is just another ordinary high school student. As I've discussed throughout this video, season two of Sound Euphonium connects maturity with one lesson in particular, namely speaking your mind and being honest with your loved ones. And in retrospect, Asuka is the one who has avoided doing this most of all. The first major sign was in the storyline of Mizore and Nozomi. Asuka consistently dismissed Nozomi's requests to rejoin the club without disclosing her reasons for doing so. And that's what weighed on Nozomi's mind most of all. Kumiko also tried to figure out Asuka's reasoning, but she didn't get any answers from her senior either. 
And Nozomi's response to this is telling. Of course she didn't. A mere mortal surely couldn't comprehend the mind of someone exceptional like Asuka. But as we peel back the layers of Asuka's character, we come to understand that she isn't special, and that her consistent reluctance to disclose her true feelings isn't a virtue at all. More than that, the conclusion of this storyline makes it clear that Asuka fundamentally doesn't understand how to handle interpersonal issues. Asuka knew that Mizure was severely traumatized by Nozomi abandoning her, by Nozomi, but her solution was to keep them apart at any cost. Asuka is convinced that Mizure could never reconcile with Nozomi, and therefore she has to make sure that Nozomi doesn't get into the club no matter what. But as we saw, this ostensibly irreversible scar was actually healed as soon as the two former friends resolved their misunderstanding. And if not for Asuka, that would have happened much sooner. By now, I've talked a lot about how the second season deconstructs Asuka as someone special, that it highlights her flaws, her human side. And yet, that isn't the entire story either. By the end of the season, Asuka reclaims just a little bit of her mystique. After the scene where Kumiko opens up to Asuka and pleads with her to return to the club, Asuka does just that. She barges into the classroom and announces her return. But not because Kumiko gave her a change of heart. Rather, she reveals that her mock exam netted her a top score nationwide. And so, she could convince her mom that her studies didn't suffer one bit from her club activities. Despite all the talk about the club needing to stop relying on Asuka for everything, and that Asuka is just like everyone else, the vice captain proves once again that she excels at everything she sets her mind on, that she is truly an exception to the rule. And so, the Kitauchi Orchestra can dream on for just a tad longer, as they head towards nationals. That at last brings me to the season's finale, an episode that truly marks the end of an era. It's the graduation of the third year students, of Haruka, of Kaori, of Asuka. Except, Asuka is nowhere to be found. Kumiko eventually stumbles upon her, sneaking off on her own. And that gives us one of the most striking juxtapositions in the entire story. Between the person who changed tremendously over the course of the season, and the person who seemingly refuses to change at all. Kumiko says to Asuka that she needs to tell her something, but Asuka responds with the joke she's been using throughout the entire series. Whenever Kumiko would bring up a serious topic, Asuka always tried to deflect it by asking if she wants to discuss her love life or if she wants to confess to her. But this time around, that's exactly what Kumiko is here for. Sound Euphonium's second season is at its heart a story about the nature of love. Its thematic throughline is about Kumiko learning to look beyond the facade of talent and ambition, and to see the need for human connection underneath. Over the course of the season, she's seen two friends who'd grown apart patch up their relationship. She's seen her teacher cope with loss through enduring this blaze of love. She and her sister have come to understand just how much they mean to each other. And so, Kumiko can only see off her senior in one way, with a confession of love. This is a testament to Kumiko's growth over the course of these past episodes, that she can tell Asuka, in all honesty, how much she means to her. Asuka, however, is the one person who refuses to speak her mind until the very end. She simply hands Kumiko the music score her father gave her, and walks off, never disclosing her true feelings. 
and when Kumiko tells her that she doesn't want to say goodbye, Asuka couldn't agree more. After all, not speaking things out is her way of doing things. And with that, Asuka Tanaka graduates and enters the world of adults. The last special person standing has departed.